Hi everyone. At the end of the last episode, I set the challenge of having the falling blocks destroy the player object if they collide with it. So I'm going to go ahead and implement that now. So on the player object, I'm going to remove the box collider component. We could do this with the box collider, but since it is a 2D game, we might as well make use of the physics 2D. So I'll add a box collider 2D instead. And then hopefully remember from episode 10 on collision detection that in order for a collision to be detected, at least one of the colliding objects has to have a rigid body attached, or in this case, a rigid body 2D. Uh, since we don't want physics to actually affect our player object, we're having it entirely controlled through script, we can just toggle the is kinematic uh, toggle over here. And then on the falling block prefab, we're also going to want to remove the box collider and add a box collider 2D here as well. Now I'm going to set this 2D box collider on the falling block to be a trigger because we're not actually trying to prevent collisions between the falling block and the player. We just want to detect them so that we can destroy the player object. So that's why it's a trigger. Uh, so now if we go into the player controller, Let's have a method here to detect the collision. So we can say void on trigger enter. And we want to use the 2D version of this. So we just add 2D. And then we can say collider 2D. And I'll call this the trigger collider. All right, so remember that this method is called automatically by the 2D physics engine. So it must be spelt exactly like this. You can't make up your own name for it, otherwise it won't be called. Um, so in here, we'll want to say that if we've collided with a falling block, then destroy the player object. So currently there isn't anything else to collide with, so we could just destroy the player on any collision. But to be thorough, let's just say if trigger collider dot tag is equal to falling block, so of course we're going to have to create a falling block tag and apply that to the falling block prefab. So if it is a falling block, then we can go ahead and destroy the player game object, the object that the script is attached to. All right, so let's, uh, let's go into the falling block, say add tag, and we're going to create a tag falling block. Just be careful that you Spell that, of course, exactly the same as this over here. And then we must go onto the falling block and actually apply that tag that we've created. All right, so if we press play, let's dodge a few of these and I'll let this next one collide with me. And you can see that the player object was successfully destroyed. All right, so with that done, let's look at increasing the difficulty of the game over time. So there are two main ways that we can increase the difficulty. We can have the falling blocks spawn in more frequently, and we can have them fall faster. Let's also say that for this game, we don't want the difficulty to increase indefinitely, but we want it to sort of reach a maximum difficulty after a set amount of time. So as always, I recommend that you pause the video and try and implement all of this before going any further. Okay, so let's say that we represent the difficulty as a percentage between 0 and 1. So at the start of the game, the difficulty percentage will be 0, and then once a set amount of time has passed, we'll have reached the maximum difficulty, and so the difficulty percent will be 1. Now, there currently isn't really a logical place to put this calculation, so let's create a new script for it, and I'll just call this difficulty. All right, we can open that up. Now, this script isn't going to be attached to any object in our scene. It's just going to sit outside of the scene and be accessible to any class that needs the information. So because of this, we're going to make it static and it won't inherit from monobehavior, which means that all of this default code is useless. So let's first define an amount of time after which the maximum difficulty will be reached. So we can say static float, uh, call this seconds to max difficulty. And let's set this to maybe 60. So after a minute has passed, the game will be at its hardest. 
then we're going to want a method uh, so that other classes can find out what the current difficulty percent is. So let's create public static float. Uh, we can call this get difficulty percent. So this will return the current time divided by seconds to max difficulty. And we'll want to clamp this between 0 and 1. So we can just use mathf.clamp01 and pass in our calculation. All right, so if we now save, let's head over to the to the spawner class and let's look at increasing the frequency of the spawns as the difficulty increases. So instead of having a fixed seconds between spawns variable, let's change this to a vector two and call this seconds between spawns min max. And now down here, based on the current difficulty percent, we'll want to figure out what our current seconds between spawns value should be. Now, this is an example of a very common problem where we have two values, let's call them A and B, and then we have a percentage P that we want to use to move between them. Now, the equation to do this is simply value is equal to A plus B minus A multiplied by P. So if you think about this, if P is zero, then we can say that the value is simply equal to A, since this entire term will be cancelled out. If P is equal to one, then the value will be equal to A plus B minus A, which is of course just equal to B. So it's not a huge stretch of the imagination to conclude that a value for P somewhere between zero and one will return a value between A and B. This is called linear interpolation because we're interpolating linearly between a and b based on our value for p. You'll most commonly hear this referred to though by its attractive nickname, lerp. All right, so back in the spawner class, we're going to want to create a float seconds between spawns. And we're going to want to do a lerp operation between our maximum seconds between spawns and the minimum seconds between spawns based on the difficulty percent. So instead of doing this calculation ourselves, we can just pass this over to the maths class. So mathf.lerp, and we pass in seconds between spawns. We want to start with the maximum. So this will be the y, and work our way down to the minimum, so the x value, based on difficulty.get difficulty percent. And then just to confirm that this is working, let's do a little printout of the seconds between spawns. So if we go into Unity now, onto the spawn manager object, let's say we give it a minimum spawn time of 0.1 and a maximum spawn time of one second. Then if we play this, we should see that as time goes on, the time between spawns gets less and less. And eventually after a full minute has passed, this will be equal to 0.1. All right, let's remove the printout and let's head over to the falling block class to increase the speed based on the difficulty. So let's not give the speed variable a default value and let's create a public vector to speed min max. And then in the start method, we can say speed is equal to, once again, mathf.lerp between the minimum speed and the maximum speed based on, of course, difficulty dot get difficulty percent. All right, so let's go on to our prefab here. And let's say it's got a minimum speed of let's seven and a max speed of 15. All right, I'd like to get an idea of what the maximum difficulty is like without having to sit through all 60 seconds of this. So let's just go into the difficulty here and just say return one maximum difficulty from the outset. Press play. Whoa, that is clearly too fast. Let's maybe turn the max speed down to 13 and on the spawn manager, say make the minimum spawn time 
about 0.3. I'd also like to just uh, decrease the size of the player here, um, something like that. All right. Oh, I got a bit unlucky there. All right, this seems more reasonable. It's very difficult, but uh, it should be. Yeah, I think this is a fairly good pace for the hardest level. Um, I'm not going to tweak the difficulty extensively right now, obviously. So let's go back in here and remove this line. Let me just try it once more at the lowest difficulty. So it's maybe a bit slow, but it's uh, not too bad. You can maybe just uh, turn the initial speed up to something like 9. All right, let's quickly just work a bit on the look of the game. You can maybe go into the main camera and make the background a nice deep blue. Something like that. And let's also create a materials folder. And I'll create a new material for the player. I'll just set this to be unlit color and apply that there. We can make this a red perhaps. And then I'll also create another material for the falling blocks. This can be a lightish gray. Let's try that. So on the falling block, just go to find the material slot on the renderer. Just press here and head over to the falling block one. Let's see how this looks. There we go. It's looking much prettier than it was a moment ago. All right, that's everything for this episode. In the next one, we'll finish off this mini project by creating a game over screen. Until then, cheers.